Uh, I'm in Fort Worth with my friend Fish Canley. Fish is a World War II veteran, and he was a flight engineer on a B-29, was shot down, and he's going to tell you the rest of the story. This is Fish Canley, World War II veteran. Go ahead, Fish. Okay, I'll, well, it all started back uh, when I uh, was an aviation cadet at Yale University, six months, and I was picked as one of about 20 people to become flight engineers on a B-29. It had never flown yet. So uh, the 20 of us, after graduation there on, uh, see, it was February 4th, 1944, I guess. Or, no, it can be 40, 40, yeah, 44, yeah. And uh, so we were, went to Boeing, Seattle, where we went three months to flight engineer school on the ground. And while we were there, the B-29 first one crashed, killed the flight crew, train, uh, 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 test pilots and so on, and killed 19 people on the ground. So we were not too happy about having to fly that thing when it became in our hands. And the Air Force brass colonels and generals uh, refused to fly the B-29. So uh, uh, after we graduated, uh, we took the flying lessons in Denver for three months in B-17, B-24 to train because there weren't any B-29s. So we learned to be flight engineers and I was stationed in uh, Nebraska, Harrington, uh, Farrington, Farrington Field, Nebraska out in the country, west of Lincoln, and there we flew in B-17s to get ready to go to war. So we trained there and finished up and uh, uh, went down to uh, Kansas, uh, and there we got our B-29 fly overseas, and it wasn't too good an airplane there, and we had to force land at uh, Alamogordo, New Mexico, because it was about to shake itself to death and we got it fixed. And then we flew out to uh, uh, California and uh, there we based for overseas and left in late, uh, let's see, in the first part of uh, January 1945 or overseas, flying to Hawaii, where by the time I climbed out of the airplane, there were about 50 maintenance people taking that airplane engine area all apart, put it back together, so it would be safe to, to, to fight. And that shows you what the Air Force ground crews thought about the airplane. So they got it fixed up over my objections, because I was a engineering officer and uh, knew all about it, but uh, they did some things to fix it that I didn't know about. But anyway, right after that, so we got a two-week vacation in Hawaii. I guess we really did uh, go over there just before that year, 45. And so we had a two-week vacation in Hawaii. And then we took off for our wartime point, which was told, I was told by our uh, uh, engineering officer from the 504th Bomb Group that we were in, that we are going to be based on Tinian, but as we took off, he got the orders, we were supposed to land on uh, Saipan for some reason, so we flew over and, uh, and uh, landed on Saipan or they took our airplane away. We were a low-ranking crew, and the Saipan people got their B-29 people earlier, and uh, they needed airplanes because they'd lost so many. That's typical of the B-29. So they took ours, and we didn't have one. So in a day or two, they flew us over to Tinian Island in a war-weary B-24, three miles. So now we're on, and I arrived 
on the, see, the 12th of January on uh, Tinian Island. That's when we started flying missions. And so I flew practice missions to various places, dropping real uh, bombs and uh, uh, several of them were Japanese held islands and the fighters came up and the ground shot at us. We are flying at high altitudes, uh, 25, 30,000 feet to avoid getting shot down. So we survived that and then we flew a uh, special mission which is a world class historical item, uh, 200 B-29s, me included, flew to the jap Island of uh, Iwo Jima. And our target there was the biggest airfield, they had three airfields there. So we bombed it with 200 airplanes at 30,000 feet and missed it by two miles. And the 80% of the bombs hit out in the ocean and killed fish, 20% hit edge of the island. I'm just gonna let that ring. And uh, so uh, we uh, 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 flew home and I wasn't happy. I looked out of my window and there was sand blowing in the air on the 20 <laughs> bombs. But after the war, I've been over to Iwo Jima. First time there were 30 Marines, including a four-star Marine general. And they heard this story I'm telling you. And he's, he said, uh, you, you bombed and you don't like that mission? I said, heck no, it did no good. He said, let me tell you, Lieutenant, uh, you made foxholes for us. That <laughs> sand blew in the air is on top of solid rock. And when we invaded it, that was on the 24th of January that I bombed Iwo and on the 16th of February they invaded there and they couldn't dig in and make foxholes and here are Fizz Canley's foxholes <laughs> and I'm now an honorary Marine. I'll <laughs> go on with the story. So uh, the big thing about that mission that was good too was that uh, LeMay and his whole 20th Air Force four full wings, uh, that'd be four, three is 12 squadron uh, groups. And uh, I was in the 504th bomb group. But, but anyway, they'd, we'd been bombing and they'd been bombing since the fall of 1944 and they're not hitting anything. And they didn't know why. And the Chinese were not giving us weather data, neither dirt or, or uh, anybody over there. So uh, he didn't know what the problem was. Well, we found out in Iwo Jima. With that bomb mess, we found out that jet stream winds disallowed using Northern, the good, accurate Northern bomb site to bomb because we were missing by that two miles and they had been missing all the while this way. So LeMay, we knew he was going to do something, and we're wondering. He's a rough, tough, war-winning guy. So the next thing we're doing is flying four to 6,000 feet, doing our bombing, and hitting everything we aimed at. So uh, I guess one of the next missions, because I only got seven missions then before I got shot down, was mining the Shimonoseki Street, the main waterway between the two main Jap islands, Honshu on the south, Kyushu, no, Kyushu on the south, Honshu on the north, and dropping these mines accurately so they could be swept before upcoming invasion of Japan on 1 November 1945. And this was back in uh, uh, January, yeah. So, uh, we did that, and uh, uh, so uh, things are going pretty good. And so he says you're going to bomb from now on four to 6,000 feet, and uh, our minds went wherever they went supposed to, and uh, they were at such low altitude that unbeknownst to us, it was briefed as a cinch mission, no anti-aircraft fire and no fighters, wrong. Japanese had broken our code. Uh, 
our upcoming invasion of Okinawa was set up uh, and pretty soon after our mission there on the Shimonoseki and the biggest battleship in the world that my the, uh, it shot me down here I can't remember it, uh, anyway biggest battleship in the world Yamato that was the name of it was down there right where we were dropping our mines and shot the devil out of us put all four engines on fire and uh so uh, my job was to keep the engines running so we'd get back out to sea because Navy submarines and flying boats are out there to pick us up. So I'm trying to do that, but all these engines on fire, the interphone shot out. And uh, so uh, I'm not doing the best I can, but we can't make it. So uh, uh, we, uh, let's see. What happened? Oh, and the, the, the airplane commander put the gear down and the nose gear did go down. So I'm worried about that. And uh, the wires go through the bomb bay and burned out, I thought. But anyway, while I'm waiting, keeping these engines running, the navigator goes back behind the forward turret, which is toward the back of the forward cabin and opens the door and immediately he and the radio operator were burned up. And the flames came in where I was and uh, I couldn't breathe so I opened up the nose wheel hatch right beside my station. And uh, while I was watching, for some reason, the nose gear went down. Boom, now I got a way out. But I gotta get word to bail out, and a phone shot out, so I don't know, so I'm there with ready to go, waiting to something, and the figure from up front where the pilot, co-pilot, co-pilot is, went out, bailed out, door shut, flames again, and actually it burned my hair off that flames. Anyway, I bailed out after this guy, and I'm down, going down at less than 5,000 feet over Japan, and I happened to be over an island down there, and uh, that's where I landed. And the natives, rice farmers, tried to kill me out of two over two thousand B twenty niners down over around Japan. Less than forty came back. I'm one of them. So I lucked out, and uh, I uh, get captured. A Jap policeman saved me from these six civilians, and I don't blame them because we killed over a hundred thousand. Uh, civilians in Tokyo on, uh, let's see, January the, well, somewhere in there uh, between the 24th and the 29th. And uh, I don't blame the Japanese for not liking us. So that's, that's it. I'm liberated and, uh, and uh, then I'll become a prisoner all prisoners, B-29s were not prisoners of war, they were special prisoners to be tried and executed for killing women and children. And uh, so I was taken on the Southern Island of Kyushu, the Kipitai, the bad people in, court of the, in charge of the imprisonment of all B-29 people, special prisoners, took, oh, there was four, three airplanes shot down that night that I saw two shot down ahead of us. One crew, all 11 of them got out, and the other crew died, and here us two on the ground. So they were, I'll say 11 plus us two, put on uh, transport up to Tokyo, where I was put in the Tokyo Kimpitai headquarters dungeon right across the Emperor's Palace. Stayed there for six months. I, I faced certain death 14 times there, and most of these 2,000 people died from killings, murders, and so on. And uh, I survived all of that with the good Lord's help and got rescued by Admiral Halsey on the 29th of uh, August. And uh, LeMay, not LeMay, excuse me, uh, General Mac 
MacArthur said, no prisoners can be liberated until I liberate, until I sign a peace treaty on the Missouri. And uh, so Bull Halsey, the Admiral Fourth Fleet out there in Tokyo Bay, said to heck with MacArthur and rescued us on the 29th of August. So I'm rescued. So then I go through all kinds of hospital ships and so on. Oh, I went to Camp Amor. Oh, after the Emperor spoke, they took us, about 30 of us, out to Camp Amori. And those of you who have seen the movie Unbroken, I'm in it. And there we had two weeks of good, better, and this is a hellhole, according to the people that were there. But the prisoners fed prisoners, uh, us prisoners, uh, anything we wanted and the doctors treated us, and I was still badly wounded even after six months. So uh, I'll make it out real good, now I'm getting going back. And then while I was out there is where I got liberated from prison camp. So I'm liberated, one of the two beautiful sights out of that, and I'm gonna close my talk down. The first one was when I was taken out by Halsey's people, to Tokyo Bay. Here's the beautiful hospital ship. I'm still wounded, the USS Benevolence, and pulled up beside that about 10 of us, I guess. They were badly wounded, see me after six months. And I looked up and I saw this beautiful sight. Beautiful girls dressed in starch white uniforms, and they looked <laughs> after me. And they fed us, and they, and I, I, I I've recovered, and that's the end of my story. I got, finally got back to the United States in about uh, four months. It took me to get through all the hospitals and things. So that's it. Now I have a book, if you want to read it, Accused American War Criminal, you can read about it. That's it. Thank you very much, Fisk. It's always an honor to be with you. And we, we've had a good day. We visited with Larry O'Neill down at Fort Worth Memories and talked about the B-36. And, and I came up here to visit Fisk in his office, and he showed me around his museum. Uh, Fisk is an interesting person. Uh, we've also talked about coming up in January, the 14th of January, 2020. We're going to celebrate Fisk's 100th birthday. Uh, so we're kind of making plans for that. So, Fisk, thank you very much. Thank you for uh, your service to our country and for the sacrifices you've made. And again, this is my friend Fisk Hanley, World War II, B-29 flight engineer, and uh, I guess a war criminal. You were a special prisoner. Special Japanese war criminal. Yeah. Yeah. So, that's Fisk's story for today. He's got a lot more. Thank you very much, Fisk. You betcha. My pleasure. Thank you.